Hello, everyone. Welcome to lecture number six. This is the last lecture or video for week two of our course on the church in Islam, in which we're examining historical relationships between Muslims and Christians. This is an interesting lecture to me because we're going to look at some bright spots or figures of hope for the relationship between Christians and Muslims. I'm going to enter right into our PowerPoint and um, share it with you. Let's go to the beginning and get things started properly. There are two principal topics that we will examine together. One are those figures or bright spots in Muslim-Christian relations, and then how Pope Francis is leading the church in its relationship with Muslims today. There we have a nice image of Saint Francis, not Pope Francis, about 800 years ago, an image representing his visit across enemy lines for a peaceful discussion with the Muslim Sultan of the Mamluk Empire. Al Malik Al Kamal. We'll get back to that in a second. But first, let's start with another figure from just before the century before Abu Hamid Al Ghazali, who dies in 1111, easy date to remember. He has an interesting reading of the Islamic sources. Even though the Quran, for example, in chapter 3, verse 85, has certain passages which could suggest that only Muslims will be saved. He argued that there are certain other sources which point to a broader more um, inclusivist vision of salvation. There's a hadith, for example, in which Adam asks God, how many will be saved out of a thousand? And God says 99 will go to the party of the fire, the party of hell. But Ghazali said, as for the other um, 999, I'm not sure if I said 99, I meant to say 999. As for these 999, Ghazali said, these are not those who will be permanently condemned to hell. These are those who will pass through hell on their way to paradise. In another hadith, Muhammad says, whoever, <coughs> excuse me, whoever has heard of me and does not believe in me will be a resident of hellfire. And so Ghazali says, wasn't well, that interesting? Muhammad says, you have to have heard of me. And Ghazali actually argues that this means that those who live far away from Islamic countries and have not heard of Islam can be saved. And it also means that those who have heard of Islam but have not heard of a, a fair, accurate representation, for example, they've only heard lies about Muhammad, they too can be saved because they have not had an authentic hearing. This um, position of relative inclusivism is also a reflection of Quran chapter 17, verse 15, which suggests that God only punishes people after sending a messenger. Well, some sort of spirit of openness is known from the visit of St. Francis as mentioned before. We don't actually know historically, even though there are very early accounts of his visit to Egypt during the fifth crusade, we don't know exactly what happened. We understand from the spirit of the early Franciscans that St. Francis presumably was evangelizing, was inviting the Melek al Kamil to convert and embrace the saving faith of Christianity. Um, but nevertheless, that's, this meaning has um, had an afterlife according to which it shows possibilities for friendship between Muslims and Christians. And we see this in this nice icon um, painted by a Catholic iconographer which in Arabic there has El Qadis Francis, this Saint Francis, and El Qadis Malik al Kamil, Saint Malik al Kamil, calling also the Muslim a saint. At the bottom, by the way, it has a little Islamic inscription Praise be to God, Lord of the worlds. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Um, well, let's turn to another Francis, someone more common, who's actually um, written a lot about Islam in his magisterial documents, more than recent popes. Um, he's building in some of his writings on a document from Vatican II known as Lumen Gentium, which in section 16 does have this statement that Muslims along with us adore the one and merciful God. Also, John Paul II, although he didn't write extensively about Islam, did proclaim in front of a Muslim audience, we believe in the same God. That was in Morocco in 1985. And so Francis, when he announced the year of mercy, he um, wrote the following, among the privileged names that Islam attributes to the creator, merciful and kind. This invocation is often on the lips of faithful Muslims who feel themselves accompanied and sustained by mercy in their daily weakness. So he held up Muslims almost as an example for Christians to follow. And that was in 2015. 
More recently in 2019, Pope Francis has met and signed a document known as the Document of Human Fraternity with the Egyptian head of Al Azhar, known as Ahmed al Tayyib, in which there's a joint declaration about what our common faith in God means for humanity. And some of the language in that document seems to be inspired by the Quran, which raises interesting theological questions, mostly the idea that God willed a diversity of religions, color, sex, race, and language. I included one other image there, which is from an Egyptian movie showing goodwill on the part of Muslims to advance friendship with Christians. This is a movie known as Hassan wa Marcos or Hassan and Mark, in which a Muslim has to go undercover as a Christian and a Christian has to go under undercover as a Muslim. The Muslim who goes undercover as a Christian is the famous Omar Sharif from Dr. Shivago. You can see him there on the right. Okay, those are some of the inspirations we might find in earlier figures for the relationship between Islam and Christianity. And it shows us that there's goodwill from both Muslims and Christians. And as we continue in our um, in our mini course, we'll look forward to some theological reflections on how the church can think clearly and faithfully about its relationship with Islam.